Good morning to you, brothers and sisters. We are here again on our Sunday service, and I just think that it's going to help you as you listen carefully to the Word of God and be able to find out what God wants from you. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted. Every mountain you will be made low. The uneven ground shall become level. In the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all the people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Heavenly Father, thank you for revealing yourself to us through your only begotten Son. Our Savior Jesus Christ. Open our eyes to see you more. Open our ears to hear your voice. Open our hands to understand your desire for our lives. And may we live a lives that are pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I will call Brother Ben to come and read the word of God. Uh, coming from the book of John, chapter 1, verses 19 to 28. And then the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. Morning, everyone, and what a great time to be reading the Word of God. It's uh, such an honour to be able to read um, from John today, John 1, 19 to 28. Now, this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. I am not the Messiah. They asked him, Then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you a prophet? He answered, No. Finally they said, Who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, Make straight the ways for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, Why then do you baptise if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptise with water, John replied, but among you stands one. You do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This, is all, this all happened in Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptising. Now I'll read from Mark 1, 1 to 11. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people from Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptised by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothes made of camel's hair, with a leg leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. At that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descended upon him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven. You are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. And this is the word of the Lord. And um, yeah, cool scripture. So we'll get Johnson back to share, share his message on this. Can't wait. Thanks, Johnson. Thank you, Brother Ben, for the reading of the word of God. Uh, I'm back again. Uh, I've come up with a theme. You don't need Jesus. You don't need Jesus. It may sound a bit controversial. 
when you hear it. You don't need Jesus. The man the world needs now, who is he? A wise man like Socrates? A military genius like Alexander? A brain like Esteen? Great leaders like Gandhi or Nelson Mandela or Lincoln? Greatest theologians like Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, John Calvin, John Whistler, and others. Jesus? No, the man the world needs now is not Jesus. You may say, why are you saying this? Are you shocked at this? Do you call it Harris? If the world does not need Jesus, then whom does it need? The man the world needs even more than Jesus is John the Baptist. The world needs John the Baptist. If Jesus came without the work of John the Baptist, the world would not know, appreciate, or accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. They needed someone who is a forerunner, who is able to preach and direct people to Jesus. That is what the world needs right now. It was necessary for someone to prepare the world that when Jesus came, he might be accepted. So the season of Advent is a period of preparation for the coming of Jesus at Christmas and at the end of time. And John the Baptist's ministry is the central theme of the season going into Epiphany. God knew that the world needed someone to prepare man, humankind for God's Son. That's why our text says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Through a miraculous birth, John the Baptist was sent by God with a mission to ready the world for Christ. John the Baptist himself understood his purpose and who he was. Our gospel lesson for today tells us how John was asked who he was. He was honest to say that he was not the Christ, the prophet, or Elijah. He knew that he was sent to witness to Christ. Our text explains the work of John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He says, I'm the voice. Before you can have Christ, you must first confront John the Baptist who will prepare you to receive Christ. John the Baptist is the man the world needs now because he's the voice of God crying in the wilderness of our world. When he was asked by the religious leaders of his day, who are you? He replied, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. That's what he says. It was a voice making people realize their need of a savior. Before you want a savior, you must be convinced that you are a sinner in need of someone to save you. John the Baptist made the people of his day aware of their sins. In his preaching by the Jordan River, he exposed and condemned the sins of his day. He was a very uncomfortable figure. Someone who points out your sin is always an uncomfortable fellow to have around. He looked at the message of repentance that he delivered. His very being was a protest to the luxury and luxury of the day. He was a wild-looking figure living in the open country, dressed in an animal skin, and eating locust wild honey. In fear and frank, a forceful language, he condemned the sin of the day and called people to turn from their wickedness. So he threatened them with the damnation of hell, fire. He said that the ex was at the trunk of the tree, and every evil tree would be cut down and thrown into fire. You know we need a John the Baptist for these years. Paradoxically, we are living in the most sinful, saturated society with the least conscious of our sin. It has caused Meninga to write a book titled Whatever Became of Sin. Sin is no longer sin to the modern person. There is sin, of course, but we call it a disease or a crime. Maybe it is a neurosis or a social maladjustment. To sin is now become is human. What are we doing about our sin? 
We are accepting it as a normal way of life. We keep saying that everybody is doing it. Why shouldn't I? Sin is popular in our day. Without it, life would be dull and boring. So we expect to sin and we take it in our stride. If we are caught in sin, we are not sorry that we have done it. We are just sorry that we are caught. It's not that we have done something wrong. You know how it is. You get a ticket for speeding after the police leaves. You don't even have tears of remorse. But you betrayed yourself for not having watched the rear view mirror more closely. If I have watched, if I have done this. And since we accept sin as a fact of life, we try to control it if it gets out of hand. We are prone to legalize our sin these days. While gambling gets so popular that we can control it. We legalize gambling and get taxes from it. Several states have lotteries and many people play the lottery. A lot of countries have now legalized smoking for marijuana. Prostitution is legal and regulated in many countries in the world. Many major European cities have regulated districts and regulated brothels that pay taxes and follow certain rules. If we can't stop a sin, we shrug our shoulders and accept it as a fact of life and make it acceptable by legalizing it. Anything that we cannot stop, we are now legalizing it. We are legalizing anything. We are now legalizing abortion. We are now legalizing same-sex marriage. We are legalizing anything that we cannot stop. Because we are saying it's no longer sin. If we do not accept sin as a way of life, we deny it. We actually claim that we do nothing wrong when a public figure is having trouble with the press. He, asked, he said, I've never done anything wrong in my life. I wasn't even sent to the principal's office when I was in school. There are men who do not feel as though anything is wrong in their lives. You may kid yourself about not having any sin, but not only God knows better, all of the rest of us do. God knows that if we say we are without sin, we are liars. We are not faithful before God. Everyone is a sinner. And we need to repent. Unless we repent, things won't go well. If we do not deny that we sin, we try to hide it. This has been people's custom for the very first. After disobeying God in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve made themselves aprons of fig leaves to hide the fact they lost their innocence. When God came to them, they hide behind the trees as God called. Adam, Adam, where are you? The great king David was a master at covering up his own sin. After his adultery with Bathsheba, he tried to cover it up by having a husband murdered while he was fighting in the front lines. He seemed to have hid it successfully, except he did not hide it from God, who said nothing to say to him, Thou art the man. You are the man. Don't we do the same? We cover our footprints. We wear gloves to prevent fingerprints. To cover one lie, we tell another lie and another. We appear to be good and we pose with a false veneer pied when we are as good as hell underneath. But it is also foolish for murderer without it. What is whispered is a secret closet will one day be shouted from the housetops. What does John the Baptist tells us to do about our sin. He calls us to do the only right thing a person can do when he or she sins. This is to repent. That is what he calls people to do. This is a common way that is used so often that it has become meaningless. It means that we can come to the point that we have deeply grieved and offended God. We recognize that we are helpless and hopeless in our sins. In our lost condition, we cry out, my sins, all my sins. We ask with Paul, who will deliver me from this boat of death? To repent is to make an about face from sin to goodness, from Satan to God, from self to Christ. It means a whole new way of life, a radical change in lifestyle. An alcoholic lost his business sometime. Through AA, he conquered the habit and started up a real estate business. He named his common rebels. For sober, spelled backwards. 
through his, his, his name, he wanted to ever remind himself that he had to make an about face in his life, at least as an alcohol was concerned. It is at this point of repentance that new life begins, both for the individual or a nation. We need someone who can point a finger at what you are doing. It is this voice of John the Baptist that the world needs now so that it might confess its sins and repent. But the world needs more than the, this voice. It needs a finger pointing to the solution of sin. John the Baptist is that finger which points to Jesus as the Christ, the Savior from sin. In our text, he tells his people that if there stands one among them, they do not know. They stand someone among them they do not know. He tells them that this one will baptize with the Spirit. As Jesus approaches, John cry out, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John was not the Christ. He was only the witness to Christ, telling the world that he was one, the one who was the answer to their sins. That is Jesus Christ, is the answer. This is what our world needs. Because we have been dealing systematically with the problem of evil in our society. We have been trying to make people good by drugs, imprisonment, even rewards to attain behavior by modification. For a time we are told that education would make a people decent. Then we put confidence in passing laws. But better housing was supposed to be the answer. Then we espouse the cause of civil rights. None of these got to the heart of the problem. It is like a person praying every Wednesday in the prayer meeting asking God to clear out the cowards of sin in his life or a life. One person got tired of hearing the same prayer week after week. The person interrupted the prayer to say, don't do it, God. Don't do it, God. Don't clear out the cowards. Kill the spider. If you don't kill the spider, the cowards will continue to be there. So if you don't deal with the root and the trouble we are facing, and that is sin, we are not doing anything. So John the Baptist is the man we need today to tell us that the only solution to sin is Jesus Christ. He is the finger that points to Christ as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. All sin is against God and only God can take it away for, for, by forgiveness. And God did this by coming in Jesus of Nazareth at Christmas. That's what we have been celebrating some few weeks ago. God identified with humans becoming sin Bearing the sins of humankind for all time. His death on the cross was the perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world. This is what Christmas is real all about. He was the fulfillment of God's promise to send a Messiah to deliver the world. His name indicated his mission. For Jesus means he shall save his people from their sins. Yes, he's the savior. So the angels told the shepherds, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Jesus was born to die. The cradle and the cross are two sides of the same coin. This is according to God's wonderful plan of salvation. It is not God's will for anyone to perish and go to hell. But it is his desire that everyone be saved and have life. And that is what we need. We need to have life. The wonderful good news is that Christ did die for our sins. The way has been opened for repentant sinners to return to God and find acceptance, forgiveness, and love. Because of Christ, humanity has freedom at last. Freedom from self. Freedom from Satan. Freedom from sin. The way is opened a full, free life in Christ. Now, friends, that's what you can call good news. We need someone who can point us to Jesus Christ, who is the good news. All of this witnessing by John the Baptist is wonderful. But the question remains, why there is still so much sin in the world? More than ever it seems. We ask why. If what we said is true, there is so much guilt in the world. People are generally not happy and they live in misery caused by sin. What the world needs is a John the Baptist to witness to Christ as Savior. They need people who are bold enough to speak the truth as it is from the Bible. To tell the truth of what the Bible is saying. These days we are no longer speaking the truth because we are afraid.
that maybe my head would be on the plate like John the Baptist. That's why his head was on the plate. And I'm saying that is what people need. They need John the Baptist. This has become the privilege and responsibility of Christians. A true Christian who witness daily to Christ as Lord and Savior. Apparently we are failing in witnessing to Christ. The church should begin to be interested in witnessing through evangelism. The church is changing everything. These terms, no, 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 they are offending people. This is offending people. But what about John the Baptist? We want to take the stand of John the Baptist. We want to preach the message of John the Baptist. Repent or else you go to hell. That is what John is preaching. In a world convection on, convocation, convocation on evangelism held in Jerusalem several years ago, a final message said, every Christian is summoned to be an evangelist. We believe that one true function of the ordained minister is to train Christians for person-to-person -person witness. Every member of a congregation, every Christian should be witnessing about Christ. If we took our stance, then there will not be a person who is not repenting. We need to do that. What and when and how to witness often calls for wisdom from God. Misplaced witnessing, are you saved, can turn people off Christ. The foolproof way of witnessing is the quality of your daily life. A true Christian is a sermon without even words. Wherever you go, you are a sermon. Preach. Show that you understand. Show that you live by the word of God. To everyone you meet, people need to know. Real the world today does not need Christ. It doesn't need Christ. I'm saying this, the world does not need Christ. It needs John the Baptist. Who can tell the truth? That is what we need now. It needs John the Baptist to call people to repent and to point to Christ as a savior. Indeed, people everywhere desperately need Christ. But to get to Christ, we need first to go through John the Baptist, who convinced us of our need for Christ. He is there to tell us what we need. We desperately lack something. Something is lacking. We want Christ, but we have not repented. We need to be told the truth. Christ is the ultimate of our lives, and John is the penultimate. To get the ultimate, we must first pass through the pen ultimate. During this epiphany season, John the Baptist confronts with our sins that we might find a savior. God sent John for the purpose. Thanks be to God. But it caused John the Baptist. Because when he renounced the sins of his day, his head was put on the plate. So we need people who are courageous, who are firm in their preaching, who can call a spade a spade, who can tell the truth about what the Bible asks us. That is what we need today. Brothers and sisters, all those who profess Christ as their Savior, stand up and start witnessing. Be bold. Let us not be afraid. Let us stand up and be bold in our preaching. Let us be bold in our witnessing. We know that when God is on our side, no one can defeat us. Yes, brothers and sisters, stand up for Jesus. God bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let us pray. Lord God, loving God, you have given us a world to care for and people to love. Keep us mindful for what you call us to do and not to neglect our preaching of the word of God. Helping our fellow human beings to realize that they need a savior. Help us to make new beginnings for ourselves and for others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us take our offering. I will pray for our offerings. Heavenly Father, I pray for these offerings. I pray for everyone who acknowledge you as Lord and Savior. Those who promise to stand up for the truth. Those who do not want to dilute the word of God and speak it as it is. Father, I pray that you continue to equip us and tell us, do not be afraid, for I am always with you. 
Father, bless this offering as we give it to you so that it can be used for the expansion of your kingdom. Bless every one of us as individuals, as a church. In your name I pray. Amen. Let us receive grace. Father, we pray to you. We come to you right now. We thank you for everything that you have done. You have called us as one family by the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray to our Father through Jesus, the beloved Son, for our needs. Jesus was confirmed in his mission by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. He help us to respond with confidence to the gift of the Holy Spirit in us. Let us pray for the church, the people of God, through baptism, to share in their royal priesthood of Christ, to uphold the sanctity of human life. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen.